good evening uh, everyone this is uh, nandini from india vision institute welcome and uh, thank you for joining the fifth talk of excellence in vision science lecture series that showcases the latest research works by optometry and vision science experts uh, we have dr prema chande here with us today who will be speaking on evidence based research of ocular changes in endocrine disorders before before i hand it over to dr chande let me introduce her to you uh, dr prema chande is the head of department at lotus college of optometry and is also the consultant optometrist at roshni eye care she graduated from the elite school of optometry and has completed a phd from chitkara university in uh, chandigarh welcome dr chande uh, dear participants please drop your questions for dr chande in the chat box and for those of you who are watching our facebook live feel free to post your questions in the comment section having said that i hand it over to dr prema chandra thank you so much uh, nandini uh, thank you ivr for giving me this opportunity to share um, the research work done at lotus so it is not just my research the data is also collected by our undergraduate and postgraduate students um, so Uh, it's basically sharing an overall experience of what we do as an organization so we do a lot of work in the area not just in uh, in endocrine disorders but this is one of the areas and just couple of weeks ago when the when the community um uh, session of ldpi was on we shared a lot of work done by us in the area of uh, occupational um, in the occupational both organized and unorganized sector so this is one of the areas we work in and uh, when i was asked to talk about uh, our research work i thought this would be a good area because this seems to be an area which is not touched by most places and uh, that's one of the reasons why we chose to share this work okay so basically when we talk of endocrine disorders um we you know we do understand that uh the endocrine system is the one that produces hormones and whenever there is a dysfunction within these hormones it could be excess or under production of these hormones people develop um you know systemic issues because that's although these hormones are produced in very very minuscule quantities they still regulate a lot of mechanism physiological mechanism in the in the entire human body and by and large when we talk of the most common conditions of course you have a whole a gambit of rare endocrine disorders but the most common conditions we talk of would be diabetes um thyroid disorders and uh, pcos and when we look at the work done um towards some of these conditions you would find both um especially in the area of uh, diabetes and thyroid you would find both uh, you know enough papers from the systemic perspective and enough papers from the ophthalmology perspective so why is it important for us as optometrists to talk about these conditions one of the things which we we learned in our in our uh, understanding of you know uptake of eye care services uh, over our years of offering eye care services in 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 our in a charitable kind of an organization as where we are and where most of the big institutions like um shankar netralia or an lbpi would be we understand that the uptake of services is always been a challenge in a country like ours whenever people come they often come when it's too late the other thing which uh we again understand from already evidence based data published is that adults usually um don't visit like a preventive care clinic it's the awareness is slowly coming up in the urban areas covid has actually pushed a lot of this awareness but it's still not enough people will not go in and go for a, go for a health checkup like an annual health checkup just to see if everything is going right with this they generally react to a symptom so if they have a cough or a cold or a fever they will just report to their physician but incidentally even when they think they are generally healthy they all have i can needs if they are presbyopes they all have i can needs for near if they are myopes or single vision which likely they are they would be there or they would be accompanying their parents or their children or their spouses to an optometrist even when they are healthy so that's that's an opportunity which optometry has 
that they can otherwise have access to offering services to apparently seemingly healthy individuals, but who may be having some underlying condition. So early detection and prevention of blindness is definitely optometry is a first line and how these endocrine conditions can be um, looked at from an early detection perspective is what I would like to share today. Even if you go by the most recent data published on causes for leading blindness, of course, we all know there is cataract, there is uncorrected refractive errors, but among these is definitely diabetic retinopathy. So diabetes is an endocrine condition and it is among the leading causes of blindness, right? And this, we all know it is, it is one of the most published data and even the most recent 2021 paper um, definitely throws those numbers at us. And you can see that there is a huge surge. India is almost the diabetic capital of the world and we bet China again on this. And that's, that's something which we should all be concerned as healthcare professionals. If you look at already published work in the area of endocrine disorders, uh, ocular manifestations of endocrine disorders has been recently published in the Clinical and Experimental Optometry Journal. It's a very interesting paper for those who are interested in this area can go and read. They have listed um, both anterior segment, posterior segment, your signs, symptoms, what are the manifestations, both in common and a rare uh, endocrine uh, conditions. Also, a very interesting paper from a non-ophthalmic side is uh, a paper in the Indian Journal of Endocrinology, which talks of how the eye is a window to rare endocrine disorders. So when you do an evaluation, if you look for some of these signs and symptoms, you could not only just pick up the common endocrine issues, but also that you can pick up um, some of the very rare conditions. So that's why I thought we must look at both these papers if you're really interested in this area. As far as our focus is concerned at Lotus, we chose to focus predominantly in the areas of pre-diabetes and, and uh, PCOS. So when you generally look at endocrine and ocular changes, a lot of papers have been published. There's a lot of research works being done in the area of thyroid. So I was quite surprised when I generally looked at what is in published in the area of endocrine and ocular changes when there are 72,000 plus results showing on a Google Scholar, but surprisingly you would see even out of the first 10, which is showing here, most of them are talking of Graves, hypothyroidism, natural history of thyroid as associated with ophthalmology. Um, of course, it is something on PCOS, but again, there is predominantly Graves and Graves and Graves. It talks only about thyroid disorders. And similarly, if you look at diabetes, you would see a lot of papers published in the area of diabetic retinopathy. Somehow pre-diabetes and uh, PCOS are very little spoken of when it comes to ocular changes. So what is pre-diabetes? In the recent five or seven years, when we started doing work in 2015, 16, we had to, we had to actually educate people on what pre-diabetes is. So this is a stage which is prior to actually diabetes precipitating. So when you evaluate a patient, they are literally sitting on the fence. Um, their fasting blood sugars are a little over 100. So a little below would be a normal area, but a little over 100, but still not in the 126 plus, which is a confirmed diabetic range. So in fact, if you look at the WHO and the uh, Diabetic Foundation, a terminology used for it is impaired fasting glucose. So impaired fasting glucose or pre-diabetes is predominantly the same uh, condition. So pre-diabetes is a term coined by the American uh, Diabetic Association and it's stuck on um, because it's very easy to remember and it's, a, it's because diabetes is a common layman term. So pre-diabetes is a stage prior to diabetes and the beauty about the condition is it's reversible. You can prevent somebody from turning diabetic. So that's what caught our attention. And of course, the fact is, that India just does not have the largest number of diabetics in the world, but also is among the largest number having pre-diabetics. So one of the recent JAMA reports said there were 77 million people with pre-diabetes in India. So why are we so concerned about it? So we thought, let's look at it. Diabetes, we know uh, diabetic retinopathy is a condition that even when a person has controlled diabetes, 
and is still a diabetic for over 25 years and above, a long standing diabetes, the longer they are diabetic, you will start seeing retinopathy changes in the arm, right? So there is enough published data saying that. And there is also data which says that even though there is no diabetic retinopathy, there are structural and functional changes in the arm. So we thought, let's, why not we look at diabetes as a condition, pre-diabetes as a condition, to see if we can, you know, if there are any ocular structural and functional changes. So we started on this, um, it's doing a series of tests. So we had a lot of our undergraduate students who were involved in this research, where um, they were looking at the various areas of, of all of this. And of course, collectively, it was also contributing to a part of, part of the work done for my PhD. So here, um, we recruited young people between the age of 25 and 45. We invited them to participate in the study. Um, these are people recruited from um, among, our, among our staff, from among our patients who came in, among our people who, um, you know, accompany, uh, you know, patients and so on. So after we obtained written consent and approval, we ran an HbA1c test. So as per the Diabetic Association, American Diabetic Association, HbA1c test, which gives us a three monthly average is, is a gold standard to pick up pre-diabetes. Um, and any value which falls between uh, 5.7 and 6.4, as I showed you in the previous table, is the person is considered to be pre-diabetic. Uh, and above 6.4 is diabetes. And of course, below that would be a normal individual. So we had one group who were just, you know, were known diabetics. And then we had this group of normal people who said they were normal, they had no history of diabetes. And when we examined them with the HbA1c test, we found a whole lot of them who had pre-diabetes. And then they all underwent a complete eye examination with a series of additional tests. So we did OCTs, we measured their RNFLs, we measured their contrast functions, so we did a whole battery of functional tests um, and structural tests. So the functional tests included things like accommodation, tear film analysis, uh, specular microscopy, PSRTs, and so on. And we did a lot of structural tests where we, where we measured their endothelial cell counts, the corneal thickness, the RNFL thickness, and so on. And then later, the data was analyzed between all these groups. So we had different objectives, different groups of patients who were, um, you know, who had to be excluded for a particular data because if they were high myopes, we had to keep them out of the, um, uh, you know, already known confounders, like they would have thinner RNFLs and so on. Similarly, for all the tear parameters, we had to keep out all the contact lens bearers uh, where we wanted to study presbyopes. So we found some interesting data where, where we found that the presbyopes mid-analysis were accepting slightly higher ads than age match normals. So we said, why don't we look exclusively at a presbyopic population with pre-diabetes? So we added a whole lot of young presbyopes to, to the study. And then we looked at their accommodation and their ad acceptance. And then when we started analyzing the data, it, it threw up some very interesting numbers. So one of the publications was looking at screening for pre-diabetes in a tertiary care center, right? Now, these are seemingly normal individuals who have come in either for a routine eye exam or have accompanied their family members for a routine eye exam. And when we ran an HPNC test on them, among the people who are normal, who are claimed to be normal, almost 54% of them had pre-diabetes. Now, that's that was a big surprise number for all of us, right? So we had another study which we later did on patients with, uh, it's one of our postgraduate students ran the study where we also looked at people with a positive family history and a negative family history. Among these seemingly normal people, we looked for pre-diabetes and then we looked for other signs and symptoms. So those with family history, because we wanted to co correlate them as groups and definitely family history is a known uh, risk factor, right, for diabetes. So even for pre-diabetes, it did precipitate as a, as a risk factor. So although that was not done in this study, it was done in a later study. So definitely it's an opportunity for screening for pre-diabetes in tertiary care centers, even in optometry practices, because people do come in for their presbyopia management. That's a high risk age group. And it's a good idea to just, you know, to screen them. And what would be the risk factors? We can share some of the data we found. So when we did structural changes, 
um, we did find some of it which was statistically significant, some which were not. So we did find the RNFL was lower, but yes, it was not statistically significant, but definitely in the diabetic group compared to the normal group, it was, it was significantly lower. And these are, these are people with no retinopathy. Remember they were under, that was one of our uh, exclusion criteria that they should have no other ocular disease other than, other than refractive errors. Um, we looked at corneal pachymetry. There was again, a significant difference uh, between, the, between the three groups. Similarly, when we looked at endothelial cell count, although uh, the data was quite small for endothelial cell count after a lot of elimination for existing contact lens wearers and other ocular conditions and so on, um, within the groups, although the difference was not very significant, uh, overall uh, between the three groups, so the post-op was not so significant, but within the groups, we did find some significant difference in the mean values for the endothelial cell count. The interesting thing was the MIBO score. Again, the data was although very, very small, we did find a, uh, you know, um, a significant difference between the normal and the pre-diabetes and the normal and the diabetic groups for their MIBO score. But when you looked at the pre-diabetes and the diabetic group, the difference was not significant. So that showed that as far as um, the, the glands were concerned, the, the pre-diabetic eyes were definitely on the route towards being diabetic where, and there have been studies which also showed that there is, um, you know, loss of glands, exocrine glands that does happen uh, in diabetes. So there has been previous data that was, that was supporting this. And um, interestingly, it also showed up uh, with, with the, with the uh, mybovian glands. Uh, when we looked at the functional changes, uh, we of course had accommodation, which was measured using a VAM 5500. So an objective test, contrast sensitivity function was done using a phyloropsin charm. Um, tear film assessment was done. So we did a series of tear film assessment and of course intraocular pressure, which is part of the routine comprehensive eye exam. So when we looked at accommodation and near addition, um, it was interesting that the pre-diabetics again had lower accommodation and the diabetics had still lower accommodation. Lower accommodation in diabetics again has been reported, especially in juvenile diabetics has been, has been is, is, is a very well reported uh, result. But among the pre-diabetes, we were among the first few to start reporting this. Interestingly, when we looked at age, no, you know, the normal age acceptance of near addition, we found that we had more number of people accepting higher ads uh, in the pre-diabetic group and the diabetic group as compared to um, uh, the, the, the population which was in the, um, you know, in the normal group. So in the normal group also, some of them accepted a slightly higher addition as compared to their age match normals, but the numbers were far higher in the, in the diabetic group. Again, this data, although the difference of age was a little more significant between the normal and the pre-diabetic, between the diabetic and the pre-diabetic group, the age group was, was pretty much the same. Um, we also had uh, reasonably good results when we, when we did for um, tear breakup time. We did find that the pre-diabetics and the diabetics did show that they were more towards dry eye. So this was very difficult data to collect because we had to make sure we didn't have too many uh, long time. So we had to remove all the other confounders like long duration of uh, screen time. We had to eliminate all the contact lens wearers, the known uh, tear uh, disorder people who already said, I know I have dry eyes. So we had to remove all those people and other than refractive errors um, who are falling within that age group, we had to take them. So this was a very, very difficult one because too many confounders had to be removed from it. So it's a very small data, but a very good uh, solid data where we have uh, OSDI scores, tear prism heights, tear breakup time. So a lot of confounders that were, that were there to show that it did correlate um, with the fact that the pre-diabetics and diabetics did show that they had poor um, you know, tear stability and so on. So the contrast sensitivity data was also published and very well received. It's, it's, it's a well-read uh, study which wow. we reported. Um, we did find there was significant loss in contrast sensitivity function among the diabetics, 
and also uh, it showed delayed uh, PSRT times were reported in the in the in the diabetic and the pre-diabetic population. So the delay in the pre-diabetes was almost uh, six and a half or seven seconds, if I remember rightly, and in the diabetic population it was almost uh, eleven seconds uh, delayed as compared to the normative data. And it correlated very well with the HPA1C score. So if you looked at higher the the HPA1C score the lower was the contrast function. So this was very interesting because contrast is now increasingly becoming an important test, not just recording uh, visual acuity on a 100% black and white, almost 100% black and white chart, like a Snellen chart. But when we measure the contrast function, we can pick up very subtle changes happening in the eye, neurological issues. And there is enough normative data, both for pediatric and adult population available to see even among children, if you're seeing any delays, uh, milestone delays, you can look out for it. You can look out for other neurological retinal changes where you can see contrast loss. And pre-diabetes is definitely a pickup for, for one of these conditions. So in summary, why we are so uh, you know, keen on picking up pre-diabetes is because we know the changes can be reversed, including functional visual loss. So some of the more recent 2018-19 papers have shown um, that uh, the, those with pre-diabetes um, can, can be reversed, but to reverse it, there has to be an intervention. And for intervention, I think first the detection is the key, right? Most of them are not detected and that's our concern. So if you pick up these patients early, I wouldn't even call them patients, if you pick up these people with pre-diabetes as a condition early, we can reverse not only their functional loss, but also the fact that they, you, can, you can prevent them from becoming diabetic and then eventually developing preventable blindness or developing diabetic retinopathy. So there are enough papers that suggest the diabetic prevention program, the Indian diabetic prevention program, all of them have reported in the absence of detection and intervention, um, how many of them can convert to be diabetic over a period of one year. You can see 11%, 18%, 10%. One thing is a consensus is without intervention, a good 10% or 15% of them would turn up to be diabetic, right? And that's a number which we can definitely stop looking at the volumes which we deal with, with within our country. So you can convert them to normal glucose regulation. This is definitely something which you can do. One of my favorite slides from Dr. V. Morgan's presentations, um, you know, I've secured special permission from him to use it because that's his data and not mine. He says, even with clinical diabetes, before the complication set in, we can move the patient to a normal glucose tolerance. But the moment you see them, unfortunately, in our tertiary care centers, we start seeing them only with the background retinopathy, macular edema, diabetic retinopathy, and so on. If we get an opportunity to pick them up when they've just come in for their refractions and presbyopia management, we can convert these patients or rather stop them from turning uh, to have diabetes-related complications. So, that's something which is a natural course of the disease and it's very much in your control as optometrists, we can definitely reverse it. So our future research, you know, going on to what, because when Nandini wrote to me, she said, don't talk only of your past, also talk of your future research. So our future research is seeing how diabetes educators can function in a primary eye care setup because that's an opportunity for them to work in, right? You not only get the diabetic retinopathy cases, your glaucomas, your cataracts due to diabetes who are there, who need all that education. You also have your pre-diabetics who are there and you also have people coming in, accompanying patients who, are, who have diabetic retinopathy, who have a family history and are a high-risk population, right? So you have all the high-risk thing and how these diabetic educators can function in a primary eye care setup is something we are very excited to study about. PCOS, we are just going to start touching this area. We have done a little bit of work. Um, some work has been done even in, in dry eye and thyroid, which has, been, which has been presented in conferences by some of our young students. But now we are definitely looking at PCOS as our next area of research for endocrine disorders. It's a highly prevalent condition. It says 9.3, and this is among those detected. So definitely one out of 10, if you keep asking them history of menstrual cycles regularity, uh, definitely it throws up as a history that they do have issues and they probably can be, can be sent for an evaluation for PCOS. 
So these are very, very strong areas of endocrinology where optometrists can work and contribute towards prevention of blindness is how we are thinking. So this is more of a line for discussion. If anybody has any questions in this area, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Chande. Uh, participants, if you have any questions, as I mentioned in the beginning, please feel free to drop it in your chat box. Uh, so, um, Dr. Chande, just one quick question. You said there are you are going to start a few research works on PCOS, but have you come across any articles or and and is there any significant changes in the uh, they uh, are you find in, in yes in the yes we've seen some uh, not done on an Indian population per se. But we have seen some publications with changes in RNFL. Uh, Tearfilm disorders, if I'm not mistaken, has been reported in some cases, but RNFL has definitely been, been reported. So now we are trying to see what are the functional you know, changes which we can see which, uh, among these um, women with PCOS. But these two are definitely uh, published, uh, published work in the past. So literature review definitely shows that there are changes, ocular changes. Right. And uh, what do you think are the ocular parameters that should be assessed in, in such such uh, people apart from this TFLMs I, I think, and RNFL? I think predominantly all structural functional things which you can measure. Measure. We have mm -hmm. to see what changes are prominent because these can be then put in as an early detection. Like in pre-diabetes, when we found that contrast is, is a significant change. Uh, it, if you measure, if you suspect somebody, now when you what are the things when you suspect when a person with diabetes is front of you, right? You're looking for the most reported risk factors for diabetes. If you look at the Indian diabetic risk score, it talks of age over 30, positive family history, uh, large hip to waist ratio. Um, these are all the known uh, risk factors for people, of course, sedentary lifestyle. So when you have somebody who's giving you this kind of a history, you know, and it's a trigger for you, why don't you just look at their contrast sensitivity. If you look at the contrast, look at their accommodation, you think, is this person accepting a slightly higher ad than what they should need? Or you think, do you think the contrast is a little lower than their age matched, you know, a normal uh, normative data, which has already been published? It's, it's something you're suspecting, right? You can just tell them, why don't you just go to the lab and run an HbA1c test? It's absolutely no harm. If you think you're pre-diabetic, it's only lifestyle correction. You're not going to be put on any medication. The normal recommendation is, you know, you're just supposed to add 150 minutes work per week. You know, watch what you put in your mouth. It's just lifestyle correction before you turn diabetic. If you don't do this, within the next five, seven years, you're likely to turn diabetic. So that's uh, something which is very strong and a very valuable information you're giving to your patient, right? So in PCOS also, we predominantly would like to look at everything and see what you're picking up in these women. Maybe you will find very good markers. You know, these are basically markers which you would see, ocular markers which you would see, other than what, um, what you would look for as, you know, physical markers which, which the general physicians would look at. So a lot of it is involved in history taking. Um, I mean, optometrists have to, you mean to say like optometrists have to, like when they know this, uh, if, if someone is able to detect it early, then it's like That's saving right. one person from absolutely. We're making a big difference in their quality of life, right? Right, right, right. Uh, those are the questions that I had. This one small, uh, this one query um, is UBI is also related to in endocrine disorders, I mean, in whatever you've discussed. Uh, there have been some reports, but I haven't really seen. Uh, directly, but yeah, the others, what, what is common with uveitis is published is all the autoimmune conditions, right? The systemic autoimmune conditions and uh, um, uveitis are, is, is the most published reports, but uh, definitely it's something that's an area which can be uh, looked at, especially with uh, PCOS and things like that. It's, it's definitely a research question. I think you have to keep looking for it. And uh, this basic, I mean, the research that you were talking about, Dr. Sanjay, that you have already done uh, on, you know, uh, ocular changes in pre-diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. Do you think this, you, would you motivate more and more people to take up this topic? Yeah, and sure. We definitely need much larger data in some of it. 
So uh, it's very preliminary in a very preliminary stage, and yes, but then there's significant changes. Yes. yes, so you can definitely add to literature, you know, by looking at a larger sample, looking at different populations. Uh, you may get you may get some very interesting the national data which comes up. It's good because it's always good for undergraduates to do research, which is already giving them. I mean, all of us do that, right? You're looking at your literature before you get a cue to look at uh, research questions. So mm -hmm. it's a good idea to keep looking for it. Like one of the things which we felt we should have done was electrodiagnostics. Uh, yeah, electrodiagnostics is 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 something which is now emerging as a test for early detection for glaucoma. You have a photonegative response. There is a diabetic uh, package in some of them available. Uh, I did hear some case presentations during the lockdown from uh, from Diopsis on pre-diabetes, early changes, uh, and when the patient could, you know, regulate to normal, those changes actually reversed within the um, within the retinal layers, you know. So um, very uh, interesting work is being done internationally on pre-diabetes and electrodiagnostics, and I don't see much being done in India. That's an area which I would definitely, if I had the time and the resources, I would like to explore. So if anybody is keen on looking into that area, they should. They should definitely look at it. Perfect. Uh, so I think we do not have any more questions, but thank you so much, uh, Dr. Premat Sandhya. The first time you told me this topic, it was personally, it was a very new topic and I found it very interesting. And I look forward to your paper on the ocular changes involved in PCOS. I am actually excited to see what, what is in it. Thank you. I, think, you know, I, I, I mean, I just thought it was very different for optometry. Yes. I was, very hesitant. There may not be too many listeners, but I'm okay. Oh, this is a very, very interesting topic. I'm sure like people who ever joined us today would have felt the same. And Hopefully. yeah. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Chande, for your time and effort. Uh, you took in sharing your insights on your research works. Thank you, dear participants. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.